Last week in studying the book of John, we were in chapter 8, and we studied all the way through verse 11, and that dealt with the uh, scribes and Pharisees trying to tempt Jesus by taking a woman who was caught in the very act of adultery and bringing her to him and trying to get him in a quandary because of what the law of Moses taught, and he didn't go there. And uh, now we come to verse 12, and we see re really that the Lord continues after that whole episode, continues to teach in the temple. And he said again unto them, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. So the Pharisees charged him. And again, I remind you that uh, you need to read the totality of it yourself. And we'll try to hit the points that we want to make. Keep in mind, he's offering these witnesses by inspiration to prove the deity of Jesus Christ. So they charged him with, you're bearing witness of yourself, and your witness is not true. Now, this begins all the way through that lengthy chapter. Our Lord, I guess what we said at home, working them over. Because that's exactly what he did. Uh, he said, even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true. I like the way he did this. And of course, you always wish you could follow his example to perfection. But just making plain, bold, frank, candid statements that are true will go a long way in setting people back on their heels sometimes because people just don't normally do that. I don't know why. But to get the truth out of some people or get them to be plain about what they really believe seems to be a problem, even on matters that don't seem to make any difference. But our Lord said to the scribes and Pharisees, I know where I came from, and I know where I'm going. Notice here there's some emphasis. You do not know where I came from, and you do not know where I'm going. Then he turns to the law and he says, even in your law it has been written that the testimony of two men is true. I bear witness of myself. And the father who sent me bears witness of me. Well, of course, the miracles that he did was proof that what he taught was from heaven and who he claimed to be, he was. He says, you don't know me and you don't know my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. Now, this emphasizes something that doesn't get brought up too often. We hear in our ecumenical world efforts to try to say the Muslims and the Jews and the Christians all worship the same God. Well, that would be closer to being true as far as uh, the Jews and Christians are concerned, except they deny the deity of Christ. And we see here that uh, Christ is saying while he walked this earth, if you knew me, you would know my father also. But you deny that I am the son of God, though I've offered you proof, which proof is from the father. And the law says two witnesses, every word be established. And you still deny that I am who I say I am. That's the force of this. So the Lord continued as we go through this to emphasize his relationship to the Father. So he continues his testimony. We may not think of what our Lord do, is doing here is giving testimony, but he is. Jesus is giving testimony as to who he is and his relationship to the Father. So he continues. He said, I'm going away. You shall seek me, and you'll die in your sin. Where I'm going, you cannot come. You are below, I'm from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. 
Now, pause here and think about that for a minute. They came to this world like any other human being came to this world. So did Christ. Except he existed as a second person of the Godhead, the executor of the Father's will, co-eternal with all the attributes and nature of deity before he became flesh, as we've already studied in John 1, 14. But the thing that uh, stands out as you, as you look at these particular matters, what did he mean when he said, I'm from above and you're not? Well, he's not talking about then their flesh, how they came to have flesh. He's talking about a disposition of mind and an attitude towards spiritual things. Problem is here, they don't receive his word. They don't receive the adequate evidence and they don't receive the credible witness. Now, can we be in that position today? We certainly can. And no doubt more will reject the evidence that proves conclusively that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God that he is the only Savior. And that's sad, because in rejecting him, we'll see later what he has to say about that. There's nobody else to turn to. He says, you can't come to where I'm going. That is a sad thing. Jesus is the great physician. Jesus came into the world to save sinners. He makes it very clear that that's what he's doing in his own earthly ministry. And the inspired writers of the New Testament tell us that also. Paul even said this, uh, Jesus Christ came to the world, says sinners of whom I am chief, talking about such wicked deeds he did in persecuting the church. The point is he is the Savior. Yet here is the Savior and the only Savior saying you can't come where I'm going. Now, you can't say it. it's not because Jesus did not love us. That gets again into this false concept of love that people have, which is really nothing but, in philosophy, you'd call it romanticism. It's nothing but emotional, subjective views that rejects absolute objective truth, which is the New Testament, or at least gospel truth. So when you reach that stage, and we're going to see more about that later in this chapter. When you reach that stage to where evidence doesn't make any difference to you, you're going to hold to what you like or what you've been taught, no matter what. Well, that's exactly what these scribes and Pharisees are doing. And he says, you don't know me, and you will not follow adequate evidence and credible witnesses, and therefore you cannot come to where I'm going. Notice he says, you're from below. I'm from above. You're of this world. I'm not of this world. And that's the point he's making. You're motivated by things that are not spiritual. Uh, comment for their own spiritual. What do you know that's spiritual? Well, spirituality comes from doing God's will and God's will in his word. You don't know a thing about what's righteous or spiritual, except as he reveals his mind to us in his word. He goes ahead with this testimony and speaking to them in the temple. He just simply says, unless you believe that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Well, sin's our greatest enemy. Sin's the transgression of the law, 1 John 3, 4. Sin's the only thing that's ever separated man from God. What did Christ come for? To solve the sin problem. And he did. And on that first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ in the city of Jerusalem, as Luke records in Acts 2, the full gospel was heralded out to a whole host of folks. And they believed it. 3,000 of them were added to the Lord's church. Well, they were devout Jews. They were doing their best to approach God as only they knew how under the law. And guess what? They found out that religion would not work anymore. And they were about to make a change. So you could be devout in a religion. In a religion where maybe most of the people you know are part of it. 
You can be devout as you can be, but if it's wrong, you'll be devoutly wrong. So it's important to understand why we have this Bible in the first place. All scriptures given by inspiration of God, 2 Timothy 3.16. God re revealed his mind to us. He guided John and the other writers by his Holy Spirit. He inspired them so they would write these things. John, why are you writing? I want you to know Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the one Lord. He is the Messiah. He is deity. So, if you don't believe that he's the one, you'll die guilty of your sins. And that's the reason they can't go where he's going. He said, I speak the things which I heard from him who sent me. We spent a lot of time recently saying how much Jesus talked about, I'm here to do the Father's will. In his prayer on the night before he was crucified, he said, not my will, but thine be done. He said, my food, my sustenance is to do the Father's will. That's all he said about doing. What an example for those of us who would be Christians, understanding what's required of us when we become Christians, and those of us who are Christians as to what it means to be faithful it means to do the Father's will. Now, to go further with this passage, he said, I speak the things which I heard. Well, where did you hear it? Or who did you hear it from? Well, it's from him who sent me. Notice how he keeps emphasizing that relationship that he had with the Father and that he has with the Father when he walked in the flesh on this earth. He said, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He. I, I think of how his own fleshly brethren did not believe that he was the Son of God until after his resurrection. I think of the centurion who declared, uh, truly, this man was the Son of God. The events, and I don't know whether you've done this recently or not. Maybe you never have. But sometimes you ought to just stop and read the events on the day of the crucifixion. It's rather amazing. When you think about, and there's a song that had these words, has these words in it, that when he died, there was a great earthquake and darkness was upon the earth. And the song says, when the mighty maker died, even the very elements and the material things showed it forth who he was. And of course, that big earthquake went right through the temple and split the curtain and divided the holy place from the most holy place, which is symbolic. Because the high priest under the law of Moses going into the most holy place went in once a year to offer blood upon the uh, mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant when they still had it. This time they didn't. But he still went in and offered blood for his own sins, for the sins of all the people. He was typical of the Christ, the most holy place is heaven. And so when this happened and Christ died, the reality came. That division is broken down in the sense that Christ has actually entered. So a lot of things there that signal to people. Well, we can't go into all that right now. It's not the design of this class. But the point is, he is saying, "Who he who sent me is with me. Have you noticed how many times he said that one way or the other? He has not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. As he spoke these things, notice, many came to believe in him. As he spoke these things, the words, maybe because he is so plain spoken in stating, almost in propositional form, what he had to say about his relationship with the Father and who he was and what he was doing and the state of affairs that the Pharisees and scribes were in, their lost condition. Maybe that caused them to refocus on all the evidence 
that he had provided earlier in the miracles that he did. But nevertheless, it says that many believed in him. Well, of course, to say the least, the Lord disturbed certain Jews who had believed on him. And Jesus then said, if you abide in my word, then you are truly my disciples. There are a host of people today who say, I'm Jesus Christ's disciple. But they will not do what he said and the way he said it for the reason he said it, and they will not stick with it. You cannot be a true disciple and not abide in the teaching of Christ. To abide in is to stay in. It means you don't leave. You keep on studying and ruling your life with his truth and your submission to it. Then we see John 8 and 31 and 32. And we're used to that passage, at least around spring we are. Most people who are, I'd say most, I'd say all true Christians who are faithful are going to certainly be anchored in passages like that. After verse 30 says, and he spake these words, me believed on him. Then we come to 31. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if you continue in my word, if you abide in my word, then are you my disciple. And that little word indeed is interesting. Sometimes people kind of have it as a byword, and somebody says something and say, indeed, indeed. Well, indeed is, a deed is something you do. Well, you're truly a disciple when you stay following Jesus by keeping his commandments. Keeping his commandments is action on your part. The deed you do, thus you will be indeed in your actions, servants of God, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Well, that means that truth is very important to a person who wants to become a Christian like you read about in your own Bible. There's a great many people, and I read about them all the time, and they just basically give lip service to the Bible. They will sort of use it like an icon or some sort of idol. If you just got it, that means something. I think of the time that people are sworn into office and they put their hand on a Bible and they take the oath of allegiance or whatever it is. And yet, before the day's out or the week's out or the month's out, they're not living at all according to what they put their hand on. I remember seeing newsreels of President Truman when he was sworn in and he kissed the Bible after he had his hand on it. Yet he's noted as one of the most uh, terrible people in using the Lord's name in vain. Well, that's no good. And these Pharisees and scribes of his day under the law of Moses said, Abraham's our father. We serve Moses, which by that they were saying we're serving God. But they didn't do what Moses said. Jesus even said when they claimed Abraham to be their father, uh, which we'll see about that in just a moment, that uh, he said, well, Abraham didn't act like you. And uh, the truth must be understood the word of God is the only thing that gives us the truth of God. And thus that ought to be our key interest. Jesus said in John 17, 17, we'll visit that again later on, uh, that the truth shall make you free here. And then Father, sanctify them, set them apart. Well, set them apart from what? Set them apart from the ways of the world. And people like he's talking to here in the temple. And then believe on him. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So we are concerned. We are a people of truth. You can say, well, we're a people of love. And Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So as far as I know, the commandments of God reveal the truth of God. And when they require of us things that 
he expects us to do, then we can't think that he's accepting us when we don't comply with his will or abide in his truth or obey his commandments. Everything there meaning the same thing. So then we turn to what I made mention of just a moment ago because they come back and say, well, we're children of Abraham. And then they just outright lie. We've never been in bondage to any man. I've never understood why they could be so silly on that, make such a bold statement. They're in subjection to the Roman Empire right now. When they want to kill him, they know they cannot in and of themselves alone by a rule, rule of the council, the Jewish council of Sanhedrin, um, go out and kill him. So what do they have to do? They have to go to the Roman procurator, Pontius Pilate, to get his permission to kill him. Well, that sounds like to me there's objection to him. So does that tell us how much people can deceive themselves? These people have done that. So they uh, ask, well, how is it that uh, you should become free? Basically what they ask. But the Lord responds because he's speaking on the level of the spirit, that is, the soul. I might pause here and say uh, the word of God in speaking of the soul and spirit does does make distinctions between the two. Uh, soul can is a generic term. Soul, S-O-U-L, can mean the spirit, the inward man. I always say the real you that is not connected with the flesh in the sense that it's material, but it dwells in this body. Uh, soul is used in the same way. But soul can also mean the body and the spirit. And sometimes you do good just to study a word study of the word soul. But spirit, the spirit of man is always the same thing. It's always the inward man. So when we say singing the song, the soul will never die, then we're speaking of the inward man of the spirit. That Paul says, though the outward man perishes, the inward man is renewed day by day. So he's speaking on that level. They're not thinking about that. And they're not doing much thinking at all except a way to, to find fault with him, find a way they can kill him and reject what he's been teaching. Notice how the Lord says, how he turns the whole thing around. Everyone who commits sin is the slave to sin. And you almost could say, hear him say, that's what I'm talking about. Get on board. Understand where I'm coming from. Everyone who commits sin is the slave to sin. Paul deals with some of that in the letter to the Romans as he reminds them of what they did when they became Christians. And he's reminding them in order to motivate them to greater faithfulness. And he talks about when they were baptized into Christ. They died, death meaning death, uh, uh, separation. They died or were separated from the purpose, the habitual practice of sin. That happens when we repent. We die to sin. We no longer are intending to live as we please, but from henceforth we shall live as God pleases as he reveals in his word. And when a person repents as a child of God, if they commit sin, then they're dying to that sin. They're separating themselves from it. It's not just saying, well, I'm sorry. I see I broke your law and then turn right around and continue in it. It is dying to it. Now, it may be that a person sins numerous times. Remember the Lord said, uh, uh, Peter asked, how often shall, shall we forgive a brother? Seventy times? Well, he thought that was generous. The Lord said 70 times seven. What does he mean? As long as a person repents and confesses sins and asks for forgiveness, you forgive him. It's true, he says to these scribes and Pharisees, that you are descendants of Abraham. He'd have to be saying fleshly descendants. But it's also true that my word has no place in you. 
And he says, I speak the things which I've seen with my father, and you do the things which you've heard from your father. Well, notice, immediately they, res they respond by saying, Abraham is our father. Again, are they on the spiritual level or the fleshly level? They don't make the distinction. The Jew had a terrible time of even doing that because all he wanted to know was, am I descendant of Abraham through Jacob? That was enough. Remember Nicodemus and John 3? He never had any idea of anything other than being acceptable to God because he was a child of Abraham. Well, Jesus said to them when they said, Abraham's our father, if, you're our, if, if you are children of Abraham, and here's what's interesting, then do the works of Abraham. Well, you go back and study Abraham, and the Bible pictures him as the father of the faithful. Now, denominational people come along today and say all that one has to do is believe. No acts on the part of the one that believes at all, which really they're saying mentally assent to the fact that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the son of God. All you have to do, well, you can mentally assent to the facts of whatever, any king, living or dead. That doesn't mean that you love him, that you're going to do what he tells you and that you're subject to him and you're amenable to him. So when he says believe, he's talking about more than mentally ascending to the reality of the fact of the case. Is that involved in saving faith? Certainly it is. John is making it clear here, you must mentally receive the evidence that will cause you to assent to the fact that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. But he never stops there. He always says things like he did about Abraham. If you're the children of Abraham, he's still on the spiritual plane, then you would do what Abraham did. Well, what is Abraham noted for? Obeying God. Obey is to act. So when you hear these people today saying, well, just, just believe that Christ is the Son of God, you can't do anything in order to be saved. If you do, you're trying to work out your own salvation. Then what do you mean here with the one the Holy Spirit calls the Father of the faithful? And go over and read James 2, where James is talking about Abraham being the friend of God. When did he become the friend of God? When did he prove his friendship? When did he prove his faithfulness? When he did what God told him to in offering Isaac. That's action on his part. And so it is that that's a living, active faith, not a dead faith. Mentally assenting alone is nothing but a dead faith. You can say all day long, Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. And Jesus is going to come back at you and say, why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? So evidently some people of his day had a lot of problem with that. Even there's so many today who think they're Christians. But they don't understand biblical belief. They don't understand the faith of Abraham. Abraham's faith was living and active. He says, you're seeking to kill one who has told you the truth. Abraham never tried to kill anybody who told him the truth. That's an amazing thing. He says, you are doing the deeds of your father. Well, they're still upset, and they respond by saying, well, uh, we were not born of fornication. Have you noticed all through this, their minds on the physical? They say, we have one father, even God. Well, how can they be concerned about not being born of fornication, claiming Abraham to be their father, yet knowing they're rejecting adequate evidence, credible witnesses that proves that Jesus is the Son of God, is doing the will of the Father, and God is giving him the wherewithal to prove his sonship. They're in a quandary. Jesus answered, if God were your father, you would love me. Again, that's one of those bold statements. Let me pause here and say this. Jesus is the master teacher of which there's no greater. 
You can't get greater than him. He's the ultimate. Why can't we learn how to speak to people like he did? Well, you say we can't know the hearts of people like he did. Well, we can know when they've declared themselves what their beliefs are, and we can know for our own knowledge of the Bible when their beliefs are contrary to it. When's the last time you ask yourself, do I really love God? Do I really have faith in God? And more than that, when you're trying to teach people, have you ever looked at them and said, and said to them, do you love God? Because if you do, Jesus says, you will keep my commandments. So he says, why do you fail to understand what I'm saying to you? That's a good question. I've often wondered about that over the years. I've spent my whole life teaching. Why do you fail to understand? Obviously, he didn't think they were incapable of understanding. He knew they could understand him. So this is a way of trying to get them to look within themselves and say, why don't you understand? What's hindering you? Well, we would do well many times, whether it's in becoming a Christian or growing and developing to be more like Christ in the church. Is there something that we're holding on to that when we come across the truth of God that says that's not authorized by the Christ, that's not characteristic of faithful Christians, but we have a reason for holding on to it that causes us not to obey the Lord, what it comes down to. So why do you fail to understand what I'm saying to you? Then he says, ye are of your father, the devil. And the lust of your father, you will do. The desires of your father, you will do. But then he describes it, which makes them equivalent with him. He was a murderer from the beginning. He does not stand in the truth. There is no truth in him. He is a liar and the father of lies. You know, the way we are nowadays in this country and a lot of places in the world, with stating things plainly, frankly, candidly, to the point, even bluntly, to make those statements about the devil, I'm sure there's some people I won't recall and say, what's wrong with you that you would say those things? You're harsh and hard and mean and hateful and uncaring. But that's how you can get to the point of swallowing a lie and deceiving yourself. So he asked them, which only he could do, which of you convicts me of sin? Well, now think about that. Sin's the transgression of the law. He looks right, at them, looks at them right in the face. Say, "You hate me. You don't love me. You don't care about me. You're of your father, the devil." Now, show me where I violated any commandment of the law. Now, we who are spiritual members of His spiritual body, members of His spiritual body, Christians, meaning of Christ, we who have heard the gospel and from the heart obeyed it. Our past sins have been remitted and being baptized for the remission of sins as, as repentant believers, been added to the church by the Lord himself, who are examining ourselves in the light of objective truth to make sure we're right. Now, we've got to a point nowadays where people don't even think you can say you're right. They are very well maybe saying you're wrong, but they don't know they can say anybody's right, which is ridiculous. It's absurd. The point being this. A person must reach the stage to where they can objectively examine themselves and honestly examine themselves with the truth that is the truth regardless whether you're male or female, old or young, rich or poor, whatever ethnic background, doesn't make any difference. The truth is the same to everybody. Now, when it comes to Christ, there's the truth is the same for everybody that proves that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Uh, think about it a minute. John's, John's book has been around for almost 2,000 years, as is true of the Old New Testament. And when you take Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the truth that is in those, the evidence that's there, the facts that are there, they cannot be successful 
they set aside. They, they give us the truth. Facts give us truth. Without facts, there's not any truth. These witnesses that John selected as the Holy Spirit guided him to select them are stating facts. Jesus here is stating facts. And when he asked them, which of you convicts me of sin, they've got to prove he sinned. They can't do it. So he says, why do you not believe in me? There are a number of people who need to be asked after you've studied with them for a long time, What's keeping you from doing what you know is right? Over the years, I've come across people at times as erring members of the church who needed to repent. Maybe they'd fallen completely away and others may be in a sin they just wouldn't admit. Then others in becoming a Christian. That they've had to be asked you know the truth, and you know I know you know the truth, and you know God knows you know the truth. Why don't you give up all your resistance and obey it? Sometimes people need to be asked that. That's the push they need. Why don't you do what you know is right instead of resisting it? As you go through your New Testament, you'll see that there are a number of things like that in the Scriptures. Well, the Jews are truly who he said they were, children of the devil. So the Jews said, you're a Samaritan, you have a demon. I said, preaching the other day, that when they can't answer you, they attack you personally. You're a Samaritan, have a demon. I, I guess in the Jews' idea at that time, you couldn't get any worse than that. You've got a devil. You're a Samaritan. And of course, the Jews have nothing to do with Samaritans. I was preaching one time on the radio and I was doing a whole series on the design and purpose of miracles and the end of miracles. And I got back to the church building in my office. And I, I don't know whether somebody knew about the time I got back there. I was coming. I don't know how they did. Anyway, the phone rang right after I got in. The elderly lady was on the other end of the phone. She was very upset. And she was letting me know that there was still Holy Spirit baptism. She knew because she had been baptized in the Holy Spirit. And I asked her a few things about that, and she got very incensed. And her only answer was, you got a devil. I said, well, if I do have a devil, it's not me as of myself speaking. It's the devil speaking. And if you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit, cast him out. And I said, if you don't cast him out, when God's given you the power to do so, you're going to be held responsible for my soul on the day of judgment. What I got back from that was a click on the other end of the line. People need to be spoken to to where they can understand you. The Lord said to them, I don't have a demon. I honor my father. I do not seek my glory. If anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. That's interesting. We almost die physically. Unless the Lord comes back first, out of the case, there'll be a great transition. Well, what does he mean? Well, since death means separation, you're never going to be separated from God, from those things that are holy and good. You die physically, what happened to Lazarus? The angels took him into Abraham's bosom or paradise. When Jesus died on the cross, he had already said to the thief who asked, to be remembered when he came to his kingdom. And Jesus, while he was live on earth, could forgive people any way he wanted to. And so he told him, Verily I say unto thee today, shalt thou be with me in paradise. With me means he would be aware of the fact of where he was and who he was with. And he said, you'll be with me in paradise. Paul said that he had a great desire to go and Depart and be with Christ, which is far better. And that's what the Lord's saying. When he tells them, don't fear the one that can kill your body. But I tell you, you shall feel fear. Fear him who's, after he's killed, can cast both body and soul into hell. 
Well, the Jews respond saying, now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died. The prophets died. You say, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never taste of death. Are you greater than Abraham? In fact, they're saying, who do you think you are? Well, that's been heard from before also. You know, the children of the devil, when they don't love the truth, don't intend to obey the truth, and they want to defend their own sins, they all argue the same way, whether it's 2,000 years ago or right now. Jesus answered, it's my Father who glorifies me. He can work miracles because God gave him that. You do not know my Father, but I know him. If I should say that I do not know him, that I would be a liar. And then he rubs it in like you are. Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Well, the Jew said, you're not yet 50 years old. You've seen Abraham? Well, the Lord then gives that great and marvelous statement. Before Abraham was born, I am. Well, the Jews then couldn't stand that anymore. So they picked up rocks to throw at him and it wasn't time for him to die. He hid himself and went out of the temple. Well, we're coming down toward the end here and I want to notice for emphasis sake how skillfully the Lord dealt with these Jews. Now watch this as we sum these things up. In verse 34, he charged that they were bondservants of sin. Verse 37, he charged you with failure to receive his word. In verse 39, he cut them loose from Abraham, whom they claim was his, their father. In verse 44, he charged them with being the children or sons of Satan. In verse 47, he cut them loose from God. In verse 55, he charged them with lying. And then, notice, he strongly affirmed, that is, Jesus did, and defended his Messiahship. He could make men free from the bondage, from bondage to sin. He spake and taught only the truth. He was sent from God, and by God he was sent. No one could convict him of sin. Even Abraham, by faith, saw the day of the Lord and was glad. And he strongly declared his eternal existence. So again, you see the uh, apologetic Many things here that are certainly practical and applicable, but the apologetic nature of this book, Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the only begotten Son of God, the only Savior of the world. And this kind of preaching turned the first century world upside down for the Jews, but especially when it came into the Gentile world that knew nothing about the Old Testament, or the law of Moses, or living by it as a rule. They heard this at a time when they were completely at the bottom of the pit morally, and in who it was they served as this God, that God, or another, even their concept of God. And that's the reason Paul to the Ephesians, a Gentile church, said there's one Lord and one God. That was a novel thing. For that time, we've heard it so much nowadays, we don't think anything about it. There still is, though. And of the Jews who believe in God, but they do not believe in Jesus Christ. And to the Muslims, whose concept of God is totally foreign to what God is. They don't serve the same God. They serve a false God. And when it comes to Buddhists and Hindus and all of that, there is one God and Father and one Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And when you preach like it ought to, it'll cause people who believe that as he was believed on by faithful members of the church in the first century to understand then, to take him at his word, and bend the knee to him in obedience and repentance, confession of faith, and being baptized into Christ for the remission of sins and living faithful to him all the days of one's life. We'll stop here.
Lord willing, time goes on. We're able. We'll take up chapter nine next time around. Thank you. And bow with me for a word of prayer, please. Holy Father, we're thankful we could be together again tonight to meditate on these good terms, these good words, thy truth. We're thankful for Jesus, our Lord. We're thankful for the proof that shows him to be just who he claimed to be, the only begotten son. Help us, Father, to know that our prayers are heard as we go through him, the only mediator between us and thee. And may we live according to his will, that thy name might be glorified and that we would be able to hear him on the day of judgment say to us, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter ye to the joys of thy Lord. Go with us on through our various times in life to be faithful in all things. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. In Christ's name, amen.